Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to this year's Congress in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will renew your strength. I know it's taking quite a toll on you traveling from various places and coming over here. And I pray that the Lord will bless our gathering together at this time in Jesus' name. This is Congress 2015. And we're starting tonight, this great Monday night. And I pray that from this very night, the Lord will revive our souls in Jesus' name. And the Lord will do for us what he needs to do as he raises up a mighty army for the glorious work he has for us building for eternity, even at this time, that we get to a new level and a new height in the work he has appointed for us to do in Jesus' name. I pray that everyone, every single solitary one, will be blessed mightily, even from this very night, in Jesus' name. Rise up as we commit our session, this session, unto the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name. Thank you for journey mercies. Thank you for the goal, the purpose you have in heart in bringing us here. And we pray that that purpose, that goal, will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Lead us into the very revelation coming from your mind in Jesus' name. Pour out your spirit upon us. Spirit of revelation, of inspiration, and restore us to everything you've got for us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, your mighty hand will be upon everyone. And your spirit will transform our lives to be the kind of ministers you want us to be. Reveal your mind to us at this time. And be glorified in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. We're looking at Genesis as a book. We look at the content. We look at the instruction. We look at the revelation that God is giving us as it brings us to Genesis, back to the beginning. It's a book of beginnings. As you look at Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God created. Of course, it's been there before that creation. That means it's been there before creation. And so when you read in the beginning, God you understand? God has no beginning. He is eternal, infinite, self-existent, independent, immutable, unchangeable. He is perfect and powerful. In the beginning, God, mighty and eternal, created the heaven and the earth. He is the fountain of life and the fountain, the foundation of all creation. The all creation derives existence from him. God is the source of all life. He had been alive before time began and he will still continue to live when time shall be no more. He is immortal. He is incorruptible in his essence, infinite in love, infinite in wisdom, infinite in power. He is the God of creation 
and redemption. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis is an amazing book of revelation, revealing the beginning of all things except the beginning of God. What Genesis reveals the beginning, the book of Revelation reveals the end. You have Genesis at the beginning, and you have Revelation at the end. As you compare or contrast those books, in Genesis we have the commencement of heaven and earth. In Revelation we have a consummation of heaven and earth. In Genesis, we have the entrance of sin and the curse. In Revelation, we have the end of sin and the curse. In Revelation, you have the end of sin and all the consequences of sin. Genesis tells us the dawn of Satan and his activities and its Revelation that tells us the doom of Satan and his activities. In Genesis, death enters. In Revelation, death exits. You find the Revelation, you find in Genesis that sorrow began. But Revelation, sorrow is banished. It's in this book of Genesis we have the promised Savior. In Revelation we have the preeminent Savior. And so as you come to the book of Genesis, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis is a book of beginnings. The beginning of man. The beginning of the planet Earth. The beginning of marriage. The beginning of the family. The beginning of music. The beginning of civilization. The beginning of the nature of man tumbling back, tumbling into sin. The beginning of nations. Virtually the beginning of everything. And God started each all come back to that verse one again in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth the uniform testimony of all scripture is that it is god that created god that made god that brought into existence Everything you see and even what you cannot see. In Mark chapter 10, the Lord Jesus Christ himself reveals to us that God created the earth, the heaven, the universe. Mark chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 5, and Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. For from the beginning of the creation, God made them, male and female. That tells us then from the very lips of Jesus that there is a confirmation that God created the earth, the heaven, the universe. In Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 tells us and this is a confirmation of what we've just read. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world not from the evolution of the world from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they, the doubters, are without excuse because that which 
that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was hardened. Verse 25, it says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than here it is, the creator who is blessed forever and everybody said Amen. Amen. The word of God makes it very clear then. Revealed by the spirit of God. Taught by Jesus Christ who is the express image of the truth it tells us that the father god created the earth in first peter chapter 4 reading from verse 19 first peter chapter 4 verse 19 here we're told verse 19 wherefore let them that suffer According to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as a faithful creator. God is the creator. Revelation chapter 4, reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Reminding us that this world and the universe everything visible and invisible was created by God thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things nothing came by evolution thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. As we come to the book of Genesis, the beginning of God's revelation unto man, you'll find the book of Genesis chapters 1 to 11 talking about the creation, the corruption, the Babel, the, Babel, the Tower of Babel. And then that's one section. The next section is from chapter 12 talking about Abraham and talking about his pilgrimage and the things the Lord will want us to know about faithful Abraham and then you come to the last part that talks about we call them patriarchs and we call them ancestors these ancestors as you think about Isaac and Jacob and Esau and you think about the 12 sons of Jacob and Joseph in particular and the last quarter almost chapter 37 to chapter 50 talks about Joseph in particular and you have those many chapters given to Joseph why because he was the bridge between the patriarchs and the nation. By the time you bring, uh, you come to Exodus, you're looking at the people, the descendants of the children of Jacob being a nation. And as we look at the whole book, we're going to divide the whole book to three parts. Number one. Concerning falling or the first Adam. Number two, concerning faithful Abraham. Number three, concerning the feeble ancestors. Number one, the creation and the corruption through the first Adam. The creation and the corruption through the first Adam. Number two, the call and the covenant with faithful Abraham. The call and the covenant with faithful 
Abraham. Number three, the conflict and conservation of feeble ancestors. The conflicts and the con conservation of feeble ancestors. We're coming to number one. The creation is very clear from the record we have in Genesis. Let's come back to Genesis chapter one. In chapter one, you have the name of God mentioned 32 times in 31 chapters. And you have 10 commandments of the Lord. Let there be, and there was. He gave the word, he spoke the word, a word of command, and everything came into being. He created the whole earth and created the abode for man before he created man. He created man, we come to verse 26. And God said, let us make man. In the first chapter of the Bible, we have the plurality of the Godhead. Let us make man in our image, at our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Listen to this, verse 27. So God created man in his, not in their, not in their image, in his own image. Verse 26 tells you about the plurality of the Godhead. And verse 27 talks about the unity in the Godhead. The trinity, the unity and the plurality, that is the triunity. And the triunity is what you combine to form one word, the trinity of the Godhead. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish or fill up the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And look at verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made each day he took inventory he supervised he looked at what he had done and behold it was good the next day he created again and behold good and as he did everything he looked at everything that he has done and it says and God saw everything that she had made and behold it was very good. What a lesson for you and for me. That as we go from day to day and week to week, we look at what we're doing. We don't just go on walking and walking and walking. Sit back. Examine what you're doing. See what you're doing. Analyze what you're doing and see. If it's according to the plan of God, the purpose of God, the will of God, according to the expectation of God, and see if you can conclude the day, conclude the week, conclude each month, and conclude the year of the words, it is very good. It's as you take inventory like that. You look at what you're doing. From day to day and week to week and month to month and year to year. You'll be going towards the final day. The day of reckoning. And then you'll be sure that everything will be alright. Welcome to chapter 2, verse 7. This talks about, chapter 2 talks about the detail. 
detailed explanation of the creation of man. Chapter 1 talks about the creation of everything. But chapter 2 now focuses on man. Verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into him, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. What we understand is that the body made of dust of clay. It's just like the carcass. But then as God breathed into man, he sent forth his spirit into man. And man became a living soul. Now we have a spirit. We have a heart. We live. Job chapter 33 verse 4. The spirit of God has made me. And the breath of the almighty has given me life. It says yes. I may be clay in my body. I may be dust in my body. But when you really think about me, the Spirit of God made me. And the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it talks about the outer man. Verse 7. Then shall dust return to the earth as it was. That goes back to Genesis chapter 2. That man was formed out of the dust of the earth. And when man returns eventually, he'll return to the dust. Look at the latter part of the verse 7. And it says... The spirit shall return unto God who gave it. We come to Genesis now. As we come to Genesis after the creation of the man, Adam. God said, it was not good for the man to be alone. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. This man was intelligent. This man was rich. This man was healthy. This man, if any man was perfect, was perfect coming from the very hands of the Almighty God. And yet, for this rich, intelligent, perfect man, it wasn't good for him to be alone. God knew that he would need a companion. Isn't it like that today? As it was at the beginning. It's not good for the man to be alone. But then God said, I'm going to make the choice for him. He will not make the choice for himself. I will make him. And help meet for him. Suitable for him. Appropriate for him. That's what the wife is. A help suitable. A help good. A help appropriate for each man. And God made a woman out of the bone near the heart. Not bone near the head to rule over the woman authoritatively. Not bone out of the leg to trample over the woman, but bone near the heart to love the woman. And the Lord said, This beginning is to be continued. Verse 24 Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother? You know, this is not talking about Adam. Adam had no father, Adam had no mother. But God was saying, because of what I have done, and I've given Eve to Adam, because of that, 
for the rest of humanity. This is what must continue. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be tell me I can't hear you one flesh in Matthew chapter 19 this is what Christ himself re-emphasized again and this forms the basis the foundation the groundwork of what we ought to maintain in our individual families Matthew chapter 19 Verse 5, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, shall cleave unto his wife, and that way shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. As we come to chapter 3, we see that what God had created now became corrupted. Satan, Lucifer turned Satan. Cherub turned adversary. And the one created by God to be in charge of the angels in heaven became a rebel. And after he had caused the rebel, the rebellion in heaven, and then driven out, he now came to man on earth. Spoke to Eve as God said, and Satan has not changed much. Shouldn't we say Satan has not changed at all? He comes to deceive the man that has received the word, that has said the word. As God said, you'll find when he brings temptation your way, as God said, it's going to attack the word of God. It's going to attack the love of God. It's going to attack the provision of God. And if you're going to overcome that temptation, which Eve did not overcome, which Adam did not overcome, if you're going to overcome, you must counter his temptation with the truth. God has said, period, full stop. But she did not do that. Eventually, she failed. And now God came to find out. In verse 9, chapter 3, verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? What follows, even though it was an excuse, revealed the man had fallen. Judgment came. That judgment came in the form of a curse upon Adam, upon Eve, upon the serpent, the devil, the adversary. But the star of redemption began to shine even at that time. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The bruising of the heel, that's the crucifixion. The bruising of the heel of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman, that's the one born by a virgin. And that's his crucifixion. And then the bruising of the head of the serpent, that is the destruction of the evil one. 
the destruction of the enemy that had brought man to that condition. As to whether that was um, a true story or not, because there are some liberals that will question the story of creation, that will question the story of the fall of man, that will question whether Adam was a real man or it was just like um, a figure that is just a uh, name to tell a story. Job chapter 31. In Job chapter 31, reading from verse 33. Job chapter 31, verse 33. If I covered my transgressions as Adam, by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Here Job was saying, we all know that Adam, the first man, covered his transgression. He hid the sin in his bosom. He said, if I did that, my conscience will let me, and the judgment of God will be heavy on me. Romans chapter 5. To know that Adam was not a fictitious figure. He was a real, real person. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 14. It tells us, nevertheless, death rage from Adam to Moses. Wasn't Moses a real figure? Yes. Wasn't Moses a real person? Of course he was. If he was a real person, Adam here connected with him. Also was a real person. Verse 14, nevertheless, death rage from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come? That's referring to Jesus, that is. He was the first Adam. And Christ took him to bear our sin. Or the last Adam. Was he a real personality too? Yes, she was. First Timothy chapter. First Timothy, I'm reading from chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was first formed, then Eve. We we'll come back to Genesis. As we look at Genesis, we see now that man had become corrupted. What was the consequence of that? They were driven out of the garden, the garden of Eden. And now, you come to chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. This is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created him, in the likeness of God, made he him, male and female, created he them, and he blessed them. And called their name Adam. He called their name. Notice that. Not just his name. Their name. The man and the woman. That means Mr. and Mrs. Adam. Called their name in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat. Son is son. Tell me the next words there. In his own likeness, he had fallen. The sin nature had developed in him. And now he got a child in his own likeness after his image. And he called his name says, Since that time, since the time of the fall, everyone that is born into this world 
is born not in the holy, perfect, righteous, sinless, spotless nature of God, but in the nature of fallen Adam. Psalm 51. And I'm reading here from verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That means from the time of the fall of Adam, we cannot talk of um, an innocent child, an angelic child, a little cherub. And the people tell us it's only the environment that corrupts man. No, man is sinful by nature. A man is sinful by practice. He was sinful by nature before he became sinful by practice. In sin, I was shaped in equity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. That's why sin is twofold. One, the inbred sin. One in the nature. One, the depravity of man that he brings into this world. And then the second part, they are the branches going upon, growing upon an evil tree. The sins, the iniquities, and the transgressions. Psalm 58. I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Not environment. The wicked are estranged from the womb. And they go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. And so, because of that fallen nature, corruption came to the human race. And man became so corrupted. In chapter 6, verse 5, it tells us about this universal corruption. The total corruption of the nature of the man and the woman, of the whole of humanity. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You see the problem is a matter of the heart it's not just the action it's not just the outward transgression it says and every imagination of the thought of his heart was evil continually evil only evil continually look at verse 12 and God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh. You see that? All flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. That wasn't the will of God. Man did that by himself. That wasn't the predestination of God. That this will be a criminal, that will be a sinner, that will be wicked, that will be unrepentant, that will be evil. They did it by themselves. That's what brought the flood upon humanity, upon the whole earth at that time. Because for God to redeem humanity in the future, he had to wipe away that generation with a flood. Chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou, and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Again, the those who have done some archaeology, they have known that the flood was an historic if event. They've discovered that 
the fossils that is the rem the remains of the animals of those days they were swept into some valleys because of the flood but apart from what archaeology may say or not say what archaeology may prove or not prove we have the words of the lord jesus christ that confirms there was a flood in matthew chapter 24 in Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 36, But of that day and hour knowest no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not. Until the flood came, Jesus confirmed there was a Noah and his family and there was a flood the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the son of man be that was because of the corruption of the earth eventually noah came out of the ark and a new generation began noah and his three sons Noah's family and the families of the three sons but it didn't take long again until man took laws into his own hand and said when you read chapter 10 you see the various families and generations there they came now to a head they came to a conclusion chapter 11 and this is still this is the culmination the peak, the climax of the corruption in the heart of man. Chapter 11 from verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of China. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go, go to, let us make brick. And burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone. And slime a day for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city. This is not for the glory of God. This is for the glory of man. Build us a city that whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name. You see that they wanted a city for their own glory. A name for their own glory. Lest we we'll be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord had said, fill up the earth replenish the earth have dominion on land and on sea on the sea but he said no this was rebellion against the lord and the lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded and the lord said behold the people is one and they have all one language and this they begin to do and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do go let us go down again we see the plurality in the godhead let us go down and they are confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech and that's how man, how humanity was now scattered 
upon the face of the earth, which is what God had originally intended. Look at verse 8. So the Lord scattered them. The will of the Lord shall stand. They wanted to all be together in rebellion against the plan of God, the purpose of God, the will of God. But it says, so the Lord scattered them from thence upon the face of all the earth and he left off to build the city. In the next section, we come to Abraham. You'll find in the fourth section, chapters 1 to 11, it's like general history. We call it primeval history. Or you can use the other word, primitive history. Before the time of the patriarchs. As you come to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve fathers of Israel, that is the sons of Jacob, you're talking of the patriarchs. We come to that period now. And as we come to this period, we have the call of Abraham. When he was already 75 years old, it was a call to a new beginning, just like God is calling you now, to a new beginning. And it is not something that God did all together for him. He gave him the word, a command, a precept, wrapped up in that call. And Abraham had to obey to come to that new beginning. It was a break off, break up of old associations. The Lord pulled him out of the past, separating him from, from the idolatrous family, and he called him to abandonment of certainty for a future uncertainty. Come to chapter 12. Of Genesis verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land which I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed by faith. Abraham, Abraham departed in obedience to the Lord Abraham departed when you talk about faith you're talking about action when you talk about faith you're talking about appropriate action that matches what you say you believe when you talk about faith you're talking about obedience obedience to the word you are not walking by sight, you are walking by faith. It says, so Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken unto him. That's a summary of the life of a person who is walking by faith. The summary of the life of a person who believes God. He does not wait until I see as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him and Abraham was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran he had to leave something behind he had to get rid of something Joshua chapter 24 actually the family of Abraham was idolatrous and Abraham Abraham at that time was idolatrous too but the Lord called him out a step of faith coming out was a step in repentance 
forsaking the past and going forward to the possession of the future all by faith. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24 verse 2. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and uh, the father of Nacor. And they, what did they do? They served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. New Testament has something to say about the faith of Abraham. In Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 8, Hebrews 11, reading from verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, go out of idolatry and come to the only true and living God. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out, go out of the darkness of idol worship and come into the light of the revelation of the true God, called out, go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance. He obeyed. That's the faith. That's the faith. He obeyed. The appropriate action that demonstrates, that shows, that makes visible our faith is our obedience. He obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. He went out not knowing whither he went. And it is that obedience of faith, it is that listening to God and doing what God wanted him to do that was counted as righteousness. Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, we're told about Abraham, the step of faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 3. But what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. A salvation is like that today. He calls you out of sin. And without you knowing the totality of what he will do in the future, you respond to that in obedience and you obey. Then the Lord counts that as righteousness. You want to understand that Abraham did not have the written word. The Bible had not been written. And yet he followed the Lord. But because he didn't have any example before him. He didn't have any written word. His life was not without problems and pitfalls. And so you'll find even in that chapter 12 of Genesis, what happened? Those are the problems and the pitfalls he got into because he did not have the reaching word. No church, no pastor, no counselor, no prayer partner, no intercessor, nobody. And at last, in chapter 17, as the Lord saw how he was walking, the Lord said, Abraham, chapter 17, reading from verse 1. When Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me. What's the rest of that verse? And be thou perfect. Abraham, if you're going to walk with me, I'm not going to excuse imperfection. I'm not going to excuse falling and rising, getting here, getting there. Walk before me 
and be thou perfect. And they were told in verse 3, and Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. This is the place where he gave him the covenant and the circumcision. And as he gave him the circumcision, even though Abraham was 90 years old and nine, he obeyed and was circumcised. Verse 10, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And this is a picture of the circumcision the Lord wanted to do in the heart of every Israelite. Many of the Israelites thought that circumcision ended at the physical cutting off of the foreskin. But the Lord told them, the Deuteronomy chapter 30, that the cutting off of the foreskin, the physical thing, was a prelude, was an illustration, and was a preliminary to the circumcision of the heart which he wanted to do in them. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. You have done that of the body that gave you the right to be an Israelite, that has given you your citizenship and your right of belonging to the nation, but now the right to belong to the spiritual Israel and the spiritual descendants and seed of Abraham. The circumcision of heart was necessary, and this will be done not by the surgical knife of a father, a daughter, anyone, the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. And so Abraham was circumcised, but his circumcision was not limited to the physical circumcision. You understand from this verse we have read, the immediate consequence of that circumcision, which God himself will do, is that he will love the Lord his God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind. That now was to be tested as God tested the love of Abraham. God had given him a son. And he loved this son dearly. But God wanted to know whether Abraham loved the giver more than the gift. Whether Abraham loved God more than he loved Isaac. Genesis chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God detest, tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. The circumcision of our hearts will be tested. And the Lord will test who we love or what we love. Is it the gift or the giver that we love above everything? Have we come to that place where our hearts are circumcised? That we love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. It's easy to just say it, put it into words. Lord, I love you, Simon, son of Jonas. Lovest thou me? That's not the question. 
lovest thou me more than these? Yes, Lord. Yea, Lord. Thou knowest that I love thee. Demonstrate it. Feed 